Good morning and happy fourth. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, in whose name the founders of this country won liberty for themselves and for us, and lit the torch of freedom for nations then unborn, grant that we and all the people of this land may have grace to maintain our liberties and righteousness and peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rains on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Good morning, friends. Today, the 4th of July, we remember and celebrate our freedom. It's hard to discuss our freedom today with protests in the streets and hearings over insurrections happening. It's apparent that we as a nation have lost our way. And we can no longer agree on what truth is, much less which way to move forward. And the question we as followers of Christ must ask ourselves is how do we follow Christ in days like these? Give me three people and we would probably have five opinions and maybe an abstention thrown into boot. We are in a tough time, no argument. But this is nothing new. People are problematic. Groups of people are even worse. And some of the oldest stories ever recorded looked at the problematic nature of ruling, and we collectively do not know what exactly it is that we want. Whether we look at the Tower of Babel in Genesis, or even what we've reduced to children's stories coming from Aesop, the Greek slave and storyteller from around the 5th century BCE, he told this story, and here is his notorious The Frogs Who Wished for a King by Aesop. The frogs were tired of governing themselves, and they had so much freedom that it had spoiled them. And they did nothing but sit around croaking in a bored manner and wishing for a government that could entertain them with the pomp and display of royalty and rule them in a way to make them know that they were being ruled. No milk and water government for them, so they declared. So they sent a petition to King Jupiter asking for a king. And Jupiter, their god, saw what simple and foolish creatures they were, but to keep them quiet and make them think they had a king, he threw down a huge log, which fell into the water with a great splash. The frogs hid themselves among the reeds and grasses, thinking the new king to be, the saint, to be some fearful giant, but they soon discovered how tame and peaceable King Log was. And in a short time, the younger frogs were using him for a diving platform, while the older frogs made him a meeting place where they complained loudly to Jupiter about the government. To teach the frogs a lesson, the ruler of the gods now sent a crane to be the king of Frogland. And the crane proved to be a very different sort of king from the old log. He gobbled up the poor frogs right and left, and they soon saw what fools they had been. And mournful croaks, they begged Jupiter to take away the cruel tyrant before they should all be destroyed. How now, cried Jupiter, are you not yet content? You have what you asked for, and so you only have yourselves to blame for your misfortunes. Ancient wisdom still rings true. Now, in a Christian context, I've always heard it said, be careful what you pray for, you just may get it. And the frogs in our story wanted a laissez-faire government until they didn't. And then, they, and then a strong hand until they felt the weight of it. It sounds all too familiar. But today in our colic, we pray for something particular. Grant that we and all the people of this land may have grace to maintain our liberties and righteousness and peace. Now if we use that phrase, maintain our liberties, each of us would prioritize and think of those differently. That's where the rage and the fear that's being expressed is coming from these days, especially after recent Supreme Court decisions. What is liberty to, to some is seen as oppression from another, 
and vice versa. So where? Where exactly is our hope? For me, it comes from the approach to the phrase, maintain our liberties. How are we to do that? Through grace. Quote, that we may have grace to maintain our liberties in righteousness and peace. We give grace and we uphold righteousness and peace personally. Last week in one of the most heart-wrenching emails I've ever had to send as a pastor, I had to write to you, the members of the flock in my charge, that someone somewhere was talking about attacking our congregations and our Episcopal Church. The presiding bishop's office felt that this was credible enough to share with our bishops, and our bishops shared it with us. People were enraged enough to threaten violence over positions we've taken as a church. Our local police felt it important enough to reach out to me directly. And this is where the price of freedom is shown. We've taken many positions that some see as wrong because of our values. As a part of the Anglican tradition, we've always chosen the via media, the middle way. And we're very Protestant and at the same time very Catholic. We're very conservative, while at the same time very liberal. We have a common form and a wide range of living out our common faith. We choose to try and avoid the excesses and violence that took place on the European continent during the Protestant Reformation. To limited success historically, but we did try. One way we attempted to do that was through this approach, the via media, the middle way. Now this middle way focuses us, focuses us on the form and not on the underlying beliefs, which are a smorgasbord in most congregations, and we've chosen to be okay with that. As homogenous as the Anglican Church appeared to be culturally, it recognized that the ways and motivations of the human heart, mind, and soul are varied and diverse, and we reside in the comfort of that knowledge and the occasional discomfort of that diversity. My favorite example of this was Queen Elizabeth's poem in response to what happens during the Eucharist. Is it actually the body and blood of Jesus Christ, transubstantiation, or is it the spirit in the elements, consubstantiation? She wrote this, "'Twas God the word that spake it, he took the bread and break it, and what the word did make it, that I believe and take it." She dances through the raindrop so beautifully stating it is what it is, without straying too far one way or the other. It just is what it is. And we, following the, in the Anglican path of the Via Media, attempt to do the same. Now the sad part is, in this environment of black and white or bifurcated thinking, we see that not picking away is an assumption of compliance or opposition, depending on whether we are given the benefit of the doubt or not. And so often in these days, we are not. Friends, we are about living out our faith and inviting others to join our path. And whether they do or do not, we are still committed to their well-being and personhood. This is so integral to our approach in the faith of Christ that we include it in the vows for our baptismal covenant. Here are just two questions, particularly appropriate. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I will, with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will, with God's help. This comes from our reason, our tradition, and from Scripture. There is no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus, Paul tells us in Galatians. Friends, we need to voice our opposition to extremes, which may be, seem extreme in our climate, as too often we're pushed to adhere or to be silent. Neither is appropriate. Hanging near the front door of our house is a reminder to myself and my family before we step out into the world. It's a poem from German theologian, Reverend Martin Niemöller. He wrote it during the time of the Nazis, but it is, a poignant, but it is poignant to speak up against tyranny, but God's, also about God's predilection for the outcast and vulnerable throughout Scripture. Here's his poem. First they came for the communist, and I did not speak out, because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out, because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I did not speak out, because I was not a trade unionist. 
Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. Martin Niemöller. If on this day we say we celebrate our freedoms, the best thing we can do is to work for and defend the freedom of all. For freedom, Christ has set us free, says St. Paul. In my article last week, I mentioned a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I pray that when I have doubts and worries, I'm reminded that justice will out and that God is in control and will lead us out of any situation if we but follow him. Pray for this nation and its leaders, especially if you don't like or disagree with them. Pray for wisdom. Pray for blessing. Pray for peace. Think on it this way. If you hate the pilot of the plane, you don't pray for their failure or demise. We're all in it together. Somewhere along the way, someone thought it was in our, their, their interest to have us think in us and them. As we pray for our nation, may we pray for all of us, the U.S. And when I forget that, may God forgive me and nudge me back to our colleague. Grant that we and all the people of this land may have grace to maintain our liberties and righteousness and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Thank you for being with us. God bless you this Independence Day week, and thank you again. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.